Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Brummer, and I'm the faculty director at Georgetown's Institute of International Economic Law, and it is a great pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, a special welcome also to our speakers, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, and Ms. Kristalina Georgieva, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. I am delighted and honored that they will be joining us shortly to celebrate Black History Month. Now, before we start, I would also like to thank our co-hosts, the International Monetary Fund, for their support in making today's important conversation happen, and to Visa for their continued partnership, which supports our work on diversity, equity, and inclusion at Georgetown. Now, Black History Month is a special occasion. It is an opportunity to look back and forward, and perhaps above else, it is an uh, opportunity to be seen. Uh, after all, Black history is the art of making the unseen seen here in the United States, the art of making not just the recognized recognition of a people, of a global diaspora, but really the recognition of world history and international affairs and, and putting it into context. It is the art of understanding and interpreting the present and predicting the future while understanding the past. Now, Black History Month itself has a very interesting history. Uh, the holiday was started by the great African-American historian Carter G. Woodson in 1926 to designate a time to promote and educate people about Black history and culture. At first envisioned as a week-long opportunity to encourage the coordinated teaching of Black history in public schools in the United States, the holiday would take deep roots here in the U.S., and take off internationally as well. Officially recognized as holidays in Canada, Ireland, in the Netherlands, Germany, and the United Kingdom, and uh, celebrated in many parts of the world, including the Caribbean. Now, we're continuing the celebration here in Washington, D.C. with that international mindset uh, and celebrating the continuing story and spirit of the month with a look into Africa's place in the international monetary and financial systems. In many ways, the story is one true to black history of resilience. In sub-Saharan Africa, GDP growth since 2000 has averaged 5% per year. And between then and 19, uh, 2019, nearly 400 million people were lifted out of poverty. And the demographic trends point in the continent's favor as well. Africa uh, will have 24 million more people on average living in cities each year between 2015 and 2045, more than India and China combined. Spending by consumers and businesses in Africa totals $4 trillion, and some experts estimate household consumption to grow by over 3% annually until 2025. But as is often the case, there's a long way to go. Although the continent accounts for around 17% of the world's population and growing, it comprises roughly 3% of the world's GDP, all against the backdrop of an unprecedented pandemic and deep structural changes to the global economy. So where do we go from here? Well, we have quite literally two of the best people in the world to help us think it through. Um, uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala is the first woman the first and the first African to serve as the director general, uh, the highest position at the World Trade Organization. And she will be joining us today and the head, as I mentioned, of the International Monetary Fund, uh, managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, the only uh, second woman to ever serve in that role and a leading figure uh, on issues ranging from financial stability to economic opportunity and empowerment. So let's call them uh, uh, onto the stage, if one will, uh, to, to really uh, think through some of these uh, very I important issues. Um, uh, these are two world leaders, uh, two trailblazers, and it, it's really a treat for, for having both of you uh, uh, here to talk to us. But, but first, uh, just to make uh, a, a quick pivot here, uh, there is, of course, history upon us at the moment with the events in, in, in the Ukraine, and I, I do want to acknowledge that. Um, and there's obviously a lot of talk uh, this morning about uh, finance, about the global economy, 
and where we're all headed, um, this is a, a really of, of central importance and, and a central role to the IMF. Um, uh, uh, Managing Director, maybe you could just provide us with, with a, a brief uh, observation or maybe even a, a statement as to really what's your take on where things are for the international community and, and for global policymakers like yourself. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for starting with that. Uh, let me first reflect on how harsh this is on ordinary people. They're always those who bear the brunt of dramatic developments as those we see in Ukraine, uh, and my heart goes uh, to them. Uh, from a economic standpoint, uh, what is happening, uh, of course, has implications for uh, the economy of Ukraine, but uh, the impact is going to go beyond uh, Ukraine for three reasons. First, because uh, we have already uh, seen uh, actions taken in terms of sanctions that would add to the economic impact of this uh, crisis and uh, will transmit primarily through energy uh, prices as well as grain prices, uh, adding to what has been a growing concern of inflation uh, and how it can be countered. Uh, secondly, there are implications for the functioning of the uh, financial system, whenever there is uncertainty, and let's remember we stepped into the events in Ukraine from a position of higher uncertainty in the world economy, that uncertainty impacts confidence in emerging markets, and often we see outflows from emerging markets when we need exactly the opposite, more financing uh, going uh, there. And third, we need to recognize uh, that uh, there would be implications uh, in the uh, neighborhood because some of the countries, Central Asia, the Caucasus, uh, Moldova, uh, are more economically uh, connected, uh, uh, but also there can be uh, more uh, tension uh, stemming from it, it, what is happening. And of course, uh, we would carefully assess what is the impact broadly on the world, world economy uh, at a time when we are uh, barely striving to recover from the uh, COVID-induced economic uh, crisis. Uh, let me just say something uh, personal. My brother is married to a Ukrainian. They are in Kharkiv. This is a, a city at the border with Russia. Uh, and when I talk to uh, him, uh, I feel so strongly for all, for his family, of course, but for everybody there uh, to wake up to the sounds of uh, uh, bombing uh, and uh, to be unsure about what the next would uh, bring. Uh, I. I know right now it is so difficult to see a pathway to peace, but peace must be pursued and we must find a way uh, to bring, bring that peace that people are desperate uh, for. You know, I, I, I appreciate that and, um, uh, you know, our, our, our thoughts and prayers are, 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 are with your family and for all those families in, in Ukraine. It is a, a very serious uh, situation. And, and as you mentioned, it, it's, it's one, you know, with, with a really global impact um, on the economy and, and, and on the global economy and, and far beyond even Europe uh, for the United yeah. States um, and, and for emerging markets, including Africa. Uh, history is, is very much upon us. Um, Dr. Ngozi, you know, just, just to transition back to sort of, you know, our, our larger theme about sort of history, and obviously we have a continent that's, uh, of Africa that's going to be navigating lots of different issues, including the repercussions from, from Ukraine, but also the pandemic and, and the inflation, and we'll get to that. Um, but, but you, you are a history maker. I mean, you, you are familiar with history. 
Um, uh, not only are uh, one of our Black History Month speakers, but but you are a history maker in your own right and bring a really interesting perspective um, to the overall conversation. Um, maybe just taking a step back before we get into all the details, maybe you can get your sense uh, as to your story in, in your own words and, and, and then what, you know, Black history means uh, both for you uh, over time in your life, but, but also in the, in the larger um, global moment in which we find ourselves. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, before I, I say that, I'll just say a quick word on, on the, the situation in Ukraine, just to second or support uh, Kristalina's uh, words about um, feeling for the people um, who are caught up in this in Ukraine and elsewhere, those who will be impacted. Uh, but also to say that uh, among the economic impacts, of course, is that of trade. Ukraine is one of the largest uh, wheat exporters in the world. And uh, their inability to export wheat just reminds me of what happened during the food crisis of 2008, 2009, when I was at the World Bank and uh, people were panicking. And, you know, so the world price of uh, wheat and bread in countries was really um, increasing at a rapid pace. And uh, Ukraine at that time had uh, held back its wheat exports. And, and so we had to go to Ukraine to try and persuade them to put the wheat back on the world market so that um, it, the prices could come down. And they did that. So my mind just goes back to that. There's going to be a big impact with respect to, to wheat prices and prices of bread for ordinary people as well. So part of the economic uh, consequence. But like Kristalina was saying, I think the biggest thing is uh, to, to stand with all the people who are being impacted by this and hope that it will soon be over and there'll be peace. Um, <clears throat> coming back to the question you asked, uh, it's, uh, you know, very difficult when you're worrying about uh, world events and problems to think about making history or being part of history. But I would say that it's the is the, the members of the WTO who actually made history by electing me uh, into this uh, position for the first time, a woman, an African, uh, uh, into the position. Um, and it comes, of course, then with an awful sense of responsibility. But as I look at my uh, trajectory or history and I look at uh, Black History Month, what comes to my mind is what Henry Louis Gates said that the thing about black history is that the truth is so much more complex than you could make up or you could imagine. And uh, when you stand back and look at it and you think about black history from slavery to apartheid to colonialism, and through all of this, black people have somehow survived and thrived. What I think about during Black History Month is sheer resilience of black people and just how proud uh, I am of that, that in spite of all the adversities then and now, uh, black people can put their heads up. Uh, they, they are still fighting wherever they are and they're still making history. So that's what it means to me. Well, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, we acknowledge and, and uh, are, are, are obviously um, the, the world is 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 very proud and 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 uh, acknowledging both, frankly, of of the paths that that you guys are are, are blazing. We were joking before coming on about you know what it's like to be a a uh, global leader, but but both of you are are, are doing just that, and and uh, we appreciate that. Um, Kristalina, you know you, you've been a treasure to us here over at Georgetown, um, and and again. Um, you're a history maker and, and have shattered your fair share of uh, ceilings around town and have a keen sense of, of history. Uh, from your perch at the IMF, you know, when you think about Africa over that last millennium, and we heard Dr. Ngozi sort of bringing up all these different episodes within the history of, of Africa and, and its contributions to the economy, you know, from, from breadbasket of the world, you know, through apartheid to the post-pandemic age, you know, where is Africa today in the context of the international financial and economic system? You know, and, and what does the continent, in your view, have going for it? And, and, and what are the major challenges? 
Uh, let me first say uh, Hoya Saksa to all students and professors at Georgetown uh, University. Uh, <laughs> great to be uh, to be with you, and uh, uh, great that I'm with uh, Ngozi, uh, someone I respect tremendously uh, to celebrate uh, Black history uh, and uh, to make my small contribution to the discussion uh, today. Uh, let me first start with a small uh, uh, personal memory. Uh, I lived uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain in Bulgaria, and uh, for a big chunk of my life, I simply had not seen uh, Black people until we hosted uh, in Sofia uh, a uh, youth uh, festival. And there was this column of students from all of all over the world walking and uh, a great African woman leading one of the groups. And I was so excited uh, to see that diversity of our planet. So I rushed and, to her and hugged her. And it felt to me that the world has come uh, to Bulgaria. So my very first message is, that diversity is what makes our world rich. And uh, it is this uh, first and for, uh, most important contribution that Africa makes through the diversity, uh, vast diversity of its cultures, its people, uh, and uh, the aspiration they carry. So what does Africa have going for it? First and foremost, people. This is a youthful continent that is uh, uh, contrary to the part of the world I come from, Europe, going in demographic terms uh, towards a potential uh, of uh, that youthfulness. Uh, and uh, just to look at the numbers, uh, in the beginning of uh, the last, last century, in, in 1900, uh, Africa had 140 million people. Well, now we have 1.4 billion, 10 times more. And uh, when I think of the resource of Africa, yes, natural resources are uh, uh, rich, but it is people that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, and this is why I dream of uh, Africa that is highly educated with access to opportunities and where men and women can reach their full uh, potential. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Africa also uh, has tremendous uh, uh, growth uh, potential. Uh, it is not for, a, for no reason that we say uh, 21st century is Africa's century. And uh, before the pandemic, we have seen uh, well-managed African economies growing at a very high speed and diversifying their, their economies. And of course, uh, uh, last but not least, it is the natural uh, resources of Africa. Uh, I think of, uh, for example, DRC. Uh, this is a country where uh, most of the uh, lithium we need for batteries uh, is, uh, is being uh, produced. Uh, uh, where we have lungs of our planet that are so valuable. It is a solution country for the green transformation. And of course, Ngozi's own country, uh, because of the uh, population and because of the natural endowment, has a tremendous potential. But in this pandemic, we have seen very, something very dangerous, and it is this divergence in economic fortunes that came out of low access to vaccines and low fiscal space to support the economies. Uh, so for Africa to reach its potential, it needs African leadership for sound fundamentals of countries, and it also needs international cooperation so this pot potential can be realized. Yeah, that, that's 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 uh, really interesting. So you, you know, when you when you look at both the the human potential, uh, the people of, of 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 the continent, when you when you look at the energy, uh, when you look at the growth, um, uh, obviously the impact for consumption uh, and, and literally the role in the in global GDP is is, is going to shift. But but you do see these other uh, challenges. Um, 
fiscal and otherwise in the wake of the of, of the pandemic. Um, switching, you know, uh, Director General, uh, Dr. Ngozi, I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to offer your perspective as well from your perch over at the WTO. Um, yeah. uh, Africa has been involved, like other parts of the world, in these very dramatic attempts to organize more regional uh, coordination in trade. Uh, and, and I suppose some of that is going to be informed, at least in part, from and by um, uh, this post-pandemic economy, but it's, it's been happening well uh, in advance. I mean, when you look at the big picture, how do you view these efforts? And how are they defining Africa's place in the international trading system, and, and for that matter, the WTO? Well, thank you very much, Chris. And you know, one of the reasons I enjoy uh, uh, being in a panel or working with Kristalina is that um, she articulates so nicely uh, so many of the things that we want to say. So I'll just build on, on what Kristalina uh, has said. Incidentally, we've been colleagues and friends for many, many years. <laughs> so maybe that's why we can finish off each other's sentences sometimes. <laughs> but coming to your point, um, you know, I'm here at the WTO. Part of the reason I was excited to take the job is because I believe in the potential of trade uh, to help transform economies. And from the vantage point of where I sit, I think that Africa has not benefited the way it should from world trade. Africa's share of, the, of world trade pre-pandemic was just 3%. With the pandemic, it's falling to about 2.4%. So it's even shrinking. And uh, this is why it's exciting for us to see what the continent is doing with trade. And of course, you mentioned regional <clears throat> integration, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is the, the largest agreement in terms of numbers of countries involved. Uh, in the world and then has the potential to have a market of the 1.4 billion, 1.3, 1.4 billion people uh, uh, that Kristalina mentioned. Now, I said Africa's share of world trade is low. Africa's share of intra-regional trade is also uh, low, about 15%. So Africa trades more with the outside than with itself, which is why this regional agreement is important. If Africa can integrate better, it stands a better chance when it trades with itself of also improving people's incomes and living standards. You know, some work done by the Economic Commission for the UN Economic Commission for Africa shows that when Africa trades with itself, it trades, tends to trade more manufactured goods, more value added goods. When it trades with the outside, it's primarily raw materials and commodities. So it stands to reason that if we can improve inside trade, we can create more jobs for that young population uh, that Kristalina was talking about earlier. That's why it's exciting. I, I think the potential for a large market, for job creation, for value addition in many sectors is really, really a big one. And if Africa can seize that opportunity, many things can happen. Let me just illustrate. One area that is exciting for us now uh, uh, in this pandemic is the push, including with Kristalina and uh, the World Bank um, uh, President David Malpass and the WHO DG Ted, Dr. Tedros. We've been working together to try to work with manufacturers of vaccines to understand what's happening to production, to turn push for decentralized manufacturing in Africa. Why is that? Because the continent imports 90% of its medicines and 99% of its vaccines. And we have seen that in this pandemic, politics trumps human uh, thoughts. You know, when countries get caught, they wouldn't, uh, they'll rather keep their vaccines to themselves than export it elsewhere. So what do you have to do with that? You have to encourage manufacturing on the continent. And so with this 1.3 billion people, we can encourage the setup of a pharmaceutical industry on the continent. We no longer should we be importing such huge quantities of basics that we need. So that is one of the exciting areas we can even think of. How can we have an ecosystem 
for pharmaceutical industry in the continent. One country manufacturing some parts, another one doing fill and finish, another one doing another uh, set of, of, uh, of um, equipment related to uh, pharmaceuticals or to vaccines. So that's like a dream. And this is just one industry. I can think of many others. Now to finish, of course, to realize that dream, we have many barriers at the moment, uh, infrastructural barriers, uh, uh, bureaucratic ones that we have to overcome. You know, long lines of lorries at the border, borders uh, now that we have to look at. People crossing and moving freely. I want to see the One Africa passport of the AU come to light. I meant to bring it to show you I have one and I forgot. I'm very proud of it. If we can issue it to every African citizen, that can make movement much easier for people and then eventually for goods. So a dream and digitization. You know, we need to digitize trade and it's beginning to happen. So we need to push on that. To end, it's the prospects are fantastic. The World Bank has estimated that if we do this properly, it could result in $450 billion additional of income to people on the continent. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed uh, that all this will happen. Can, can, can I just sort of push uh, just one one line further on, on on that answer, which which was which was which was very uh, extensive? It, when you think about the, the WTO, right, which itself is is a bit at a crossroads, and you're seeing all of these this this work at at, at regional uh, integration, um, uh, but also global integration. Well, the WTO. Uh, is is like other great institutions in a in a process and in the midst of of, of rethinking how, how how it works, um, and a bit of rethinking even uh, underway with regards to dispute settlement. Uh, wh what do you see as the biggest challenges that the WTO faces, and 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 how do you view those challenges, the challenges of the WTO as as impacting uh, conversations on Africa? Well, I think the biggest challenge, uh, ch there are a, a few challenges that have, the WTO is facing at the moment. And one of the things that I'm really trying to do with the members is to see how we reform the organization, including what you alluded to, the dispute settlement system, which is the only place in the world where countries can bring trade disputes with each other. But it's uh, part of it has been paralyzed uh, and I don't want to take too much time going into the story. So we have to reform it and reinvigorate it. But that's a big challenge. To me, the biggest challenge we face here is bringing the institution up to the 21st century. Things are changing very rapidly in trade, but some of our rules need have not changed. They need to be modernized and we have areas where rules are missing and this is where i can talk about the impact on the continent i believe the future of trade is digital but we do not and we've seen in this pandemic how e-commerce has really blossomed and digital trade but today we don't have any rules that underpin global trade and that means that poorer countries smaller countries will have a a less easy time you know, penetrating the trading system digitally. It's the bigger countries who have all the means and so on who can survive. So if we, right now, I can say that uh, 86 of our members are negotiating uh, an e-commerce uh, agreement. And I'm very excited about that because if we can get that done, that means that digital trade will have fair and level playing field rules that underpin it there'll be more stability and certainty uh, for countries in Africa to trade. And particularly, we found that small and medium enterprises and women are benefiting greatly from digital trade. And this is what the continent is all about. You know, we are made up of small and medium enterprises. We're made up of women entrepreneurs. So this is just one illustration of one area where I think the WTO's challenge, if we can overcome it, can really be beneficial. Uh, uh, to the to the continent, um, and I could go on. I mean, another challenge is how to go green, and I'm saying it because I know this is a favorite area of Crystalina. Many people see trade as part of the problem uh, for for solving climate change, which is greatly impacting the African continent. 
you know, everybody knows that only uh, the continent con contributes or uh, contributed only 3% to carbon emissions, but we are seeing so much drought, flood, unprecedented. In my own village, you know, farmers are puzzled. They don't know when to plant anymore, when to harvest because of uh, climate change. But trade can help that. Trade can help spread technologies, green technologies to those areas that don't have it so that they can begin to, uh, um, to adapt. Um, <clears throat> if we can get an agreement to lower tariffs on environmental goods and services, this is also something that can be contributed and would benefit the continent. So um, in just those two areas, digital and green, we need to update our rules. We need to put rules that are not there. And it's quite exciting to think about it. Uh, you know, so many things in, in that answer and so many things that frankly spoke to me and speak to me personally, uh, because I, I uh, you know, and we in the United States are working on lots of digital issues and, and we may circle back to that kind of a conversation. You know, how do you update rules for these next generation issues, um, which is which is very difficult. Uh, managing uh, uh, director, you know, uh, uh, you know, just switching to to the the series of challenges that that institutions face, and really to your earlier answer, um, you know, when you look across the world, whether it be Africa or, or, or whether it be the United States, um, you know, the effects of of the pandemic uh, are palpable. I mean, they in in part the, the digital transformation is itself a, a reflection of the, the the need to go digital in, in the wake of, of the pandemic, but. Um, when you think about struggles with with supply chains and obviously to digital transformation of the economies, you know, you know, in in your view, how has COVID transformed or impacted the the conversation on economic growth at at the IMF? Uh, it is uh, a crisis like no other. Never before the world uh, was faced with a sudden stop of economic activities across the globe. Uh, what we did at the IMF was to, very early in the crisis, correctly diagnose the economic uh, impact. In other words, the need to stop both production and consumption uh, and uh, what is necessary to do to sustain economies in this very unusual environment. Uh, and we came up with an advice that you don't often hear from the IMF, and it was spent, but keep the receipts. We ourselves contributed to increasing the spending capacity in especially low income countries, uh, together with the World Bank that has also extended uh, large scale financing. The fund provided swiftly emergency financing to our members. Uh, and uh, almost everybody in Africa benefited from this uh, sweet uh, response. We also came up with a uh, largest in our history allocation of special drawing rights. This is the reserve asset of the IMF. It does not add to debt, but it adds to reserve and financial capacity. $650 billion. We are now working on trying to amplify the impact of this allocation by asking countries that got these SDRs but don't need them to own land to countries in need. And when we look at the uh, transformation uh, at the IMF, uh, what I would recognize is that we also uh, quickly uh, came to uh, assessing the uh, negative and the positive impacts from uh, COVID-19 on the negative side. Uh, inequality has uh, increased. Uh, in uh, many, many countries, this is a she session. It has impacted women who are in the contact uh, industries, lost jobs, or in the healthcare industries were impacted by the virus more, uh, or just because they, they nobody could could provide healthcare, uh, sorry, childcare anymore. They had to leave their jobs. So we have seen a massive. Uh, departure of women, uh, including in Africa. And let's remember, women globally fall 20% short of the labor market participation of men. Uh, so this inequality uh, is now taking uh, front and center a role in our policy uh, advice to countries. 
Uh, secondly, we recognize that if before the pandemic, we were talking about the future being digital, with the pandemic, the future has arrived. And therefore, supporting countries to digitalize and thinking about the role of digital money more rapidly uh, injected uh, in our economic lives than before. Uh, so that is uh, in a way a positive, but also somewhat negative, because if you are falling behind, digitalization may make you fall even further behind if you are not catching up uh, on it. Uh, and of course, uh, we are now dealing with the impact of actions to arrest the economic fallout, more specifically inflation. We have seen right. that demand increased very rapidly, but interruption of supply chains and the fact nobody expected that with vaccines, we would unleash demand so quickly. That is impacting uh, prices. On top of it, we see a massive shift of consumer demand from services to goods. Uh, and that impacts uh, uh, the uh, push on prices uh, as well. But then to deal with inflation, central banks need to step forward and tighten up uh, financial conditions. When they do that, the other problem that we built in during the pandemic debt, because for good reason, countries and businesses had to borrow more, this debt is now becoming more expensive. So for the IMF, the most important task we have is to carefully understand the complication of factors in each individual country because we are not anymore in 2020 when everybody was impacted the same way and everybody's action was the same. Now we have different countries at diff different stages of recovery different combination of the factors I described, and therefore policies have to be calibrated much more to country-specific conditions. And when I think of Africa, what has happened in Africa is the drag backwards from the pandemic is causing a risk of Africa reaching its full potential. We estimate that the financial gap in Africa today, just to catch up with the pre-pandemic uh, 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 growth path and to cure the impact of the pandemic, uh, is in the order of uh, $450 billion. Uh, now, Africa can mobilize some resources domestically, but clearly it needs international support to step step up. And finally, something that we have to talk about, what the pandemic has done is to uh, divert global attention from other problems, and in particular from the problem of insecurity in the Sahel, in Central African Republic, in the Horn of Africa, Sudan, we see insecurity building up. And yet, what could have been in the past concentrated international uh, attention is now somewhat lagging behind. So I feel that for us at the fund, we have globally uh, so much to do, uh, so, so, so much to uh, understand, appreciate and bring responses to. But when it comes down to Africa, we have an even higher responsibility because of the fragility of recovery in many countries and yet the enormous potential of Africa. So we concentrate to work with Africa, with African institutions, with African leaders and for Africa. So, so I note note to myself to just to have you teach my class because that was a very uh, uh, effective and extremely clear um, outlining of just sort of how different kinds of choices have ripple effects and and that how policymakers have to adapt and adjust you know to to those changes in the economy and, and that was and that was really um, great and I and I may circle back for sure to that question on digital currencies in a moment but. 
Um, Dr. Ngozi, I, I, I want to give you also a chance to sort of respond to this, you know, the, the set of factors. And you yourself have brought up this, the question of digitalization, but we also have these larger um, macroeconomic forces like inflation um, that are really uh, forcing policymakers to rethink um, what their policy responses will, will will be. I mean, when you look at the, the changing nature of the economy, still high GDP growth globally, um, still as as uh, we've just heard, you know, the need for continued bespoke solutions on country by country basis. But again, against this larger backdrop of, 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 of inflation, I mean, where do you think the, the WTO in particular sees its sweet spots for, for, for leaning in and sort of confronting some of the major macroeconomic um, challenges that, that, that the world is now facing? Well, Chris, let me say that uh, one of the things that uh, worries us uh, and worries me at the WTO is that uh, is the issue of divergence that, um, that Chris Salina spoke about. What she is seeing at the IMF in terms of the GDP growth numbers, you know, of some parts of the world or some countries recovering faster and others trailing behind is what we also see in our trade numbers. Uh, we see some regions of the world like North America, Europe, Asia, uh, the trade is rebounding much faster in those areas, whereas in Latin America, Middle East and Africa, it is much less so. And Africa, of all those, is most impacted. So that divergence is a source for worry. As we were saying in the beginning, pre-pandemic, you know, the world was kind of converging in terms of growth, although there were still some countries in Africa left behind. Now it's worse because it's diverging, and Africa is at the low end of that divergence. So that really worries us when we look at the trade numbers at the WTO. And, and we try to look at uh, how can, what can be done? How can Africa tap into the external demand outside of those economies that are rebounding faster by trading with them? Because this is one of the ways that uh, our economies can also benefit from the rebound elsewhere. And um, what can we ourselves do um, to make sure that some of the trade aspects of this work? now? One area in which the WTO uh, can lean in is, uh, is in the area of supply chains. Um, supply chains have become such a popular word now. Many people didn't think about it before, but we've all now seen that whether it's for the manufacture of certain products or to receive certain goods, supply chains matter. And supply chains are stuck because the demand exceeded expectations due to all the fiscal stimulation that was given during the pandemic and those in the shipping and logistics were thinking the world was going to go into a great recession or depression or whatever you want to call it but it, and so they reduced investment uh, in 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 logistics and left containers in di in different places so that mismatch demand rebounded supply could not keep up has led to some of these supply chain snafus uh, and weights that we see um, so that area of monitoring what happens to supply chains is one of the, the areas that the WTO can actually help play a role. We have a monitoring and transparency function. We can look at the trade facilitation measures that will help move supply chains faster. We can look at export restrictions and prohibitions that our members put in place, which may stop supply chains from functioning better. And so we are actively doing that. Let me just give you an example. At the start of the pandemic, our members had 109 export restrictions in place. And the job is to monitor this and try and bring it down. So supply, to, so we are not part of the problem. We're actually part of the solution. And these restrictions, by being monitoring that, by being transparent and knowing who, who, ha, who are, what, what members have these restrictions, we've been able to work to bring them down to 35 today um, over the course of this pandemic. And I think that is quite important. So I say it because people are only just realizing how important supply chains are. And this organization is one of those that makes supply chains flow better. 
So that's one area that the WTO uh, can really uh, um, uh, play a strong role and, and has been doing that. Let me just uh, mention one other thing to do with supply chains. You know, all of us are worried about these supply chains. But I was sitting here brainstorming with my staff. And interestingly, we saw an opportunity in, the, in, in what is happening now. Um, because of all the worries about supply chains, uh, about um, what is happening uh, uh, to businesses because of this, you see businesses trying to manage their risks differently. So people have been talking a lot about reshoring, the fact that all these problems are going to make businesses bring manufacturing back home. Yes, some of that is happening. But what we're seeing more of in our data is near shoring, moving to other nearby countries from China to Vietnam, Bangladesh, for example, even to Ethiopia. We're seeing more of that and we're seeing inventory accumulation. What we are thinking about here is how can we use this risk management to favor regions that are left behind? If you're going to near shore to other countries, why not to Africa? They started in Ethiopia. Why don't we draw Senegal in and Rwanda and Nigeria? Uh, um, you know, these countries can put their houses in order. This is something we are thinking of. So there's opportunity where people see distress. And I've been calling this re-globalization. We can use uh, uh, trade and, and this supply chain issue to re-globalize the world and bring in those countries that are marginalized back into the mainstream. Yeah, that is that is uh, fantastic, and 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 really, you know, by the way, by by pointing to the supply chain issues, it, it's very interesting. I mean, it's positioned the WTO in that conversation, in the larger macroeconomic conversation about about inflation as well. You know, uh, I, I want to get to our student questions, but I did want to ask one last thing because, because you know, you tempted me, you know, uh, by talking about uh, you know digital assets and CBDCs. I mean, just really briefly. I mean, how do you view the 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 the, the, the central bank digital currency uh, development? Um, are there any particular thoughts that you may have, um, both in the wake of? the pandemic or, or, or recent developments or, or frankly in the context of Africa about CBDCs and the work of the IMF? We uh, are uh, very clearly in a fast changing uh, environment when it comes down to digital money. Uh, we did a survey of our membership asking uh, uh, countries uh, whether they are engaged uh, in CBDCs and uh, over a hundred responded positively. They are, are either in early stages of just exploring CBDCs or they are moving into a pilot phase or as it is uh, the case with the Bahamas, Nigeria, uh, they are already uh, in uh, right. actively using uh, uh, CBDCs. Of the pilot countries, uh, the biggest pilot is in China. It has 128 million participants. Uh, and uh, is moving forward uh, uh, very, very rapidly. So is the pilot in Sweden and in other places. So CBDC, CBDCs is no more of question whether. The question is when and how. And uh, there, the number one issue for us at the IMF is to make sure that there is interoperability of different central bank digital currencies. So we don't go back into a world in which these national central bank digital currencies cannot easily talk with each other. Uh, and that question of interoperability uh, does put uh, institutions uh, like uh, the Bank for International Settlement, they're very much ahead on this topic, but also the IMF and others uh, into a position of ensuring that global co collaboration expands uh, with the same or faster speed that national uh, engagements in this area. But let's not forget the private uh, currencies, uh, the stable coins, the e-money uh, like uh, M-Pesa in, uh, in Kenya that have taken off so rapidly and for, for them the, the pandemic is uh, a big boost. Uh, there, the most important issue, uh, Chris, is regulation. 
it is like money market funds. They have to be regulated to protect the users. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, the uh, uh, Bitcoins and other uh, crypto that are called currencies, but they're not quite exactly the same I thing as uh, money. But that is, a, that is a debate that can take us forever, so I'm not going to go there. And of course, for Africa, very important to be ahead, as M-Pesa has been. But let's, let's not forget that to make use of digital money, there is a very important prerequisite, and it is called access to electricity. With 600 million Africans still not having that access guaranteed, uh, obviously we can advance digitalization, but it has to be in the broader uh, aspect of advancing development. It's a fascinating answer, fascinating answer. And um, yes, it can take all day or all a semester to discuss uh, the definition of money. I, I do it all the, uh, every, every year, it's, it's, and that's still not enough time. But um, I, speaking of, I, I did want to at least give the opportunity to, to, for a couple of student questions. Uh, we, we asked our student body you know, for a couple of interesting questions for you. Um, and uh, uh, very briefly, I'll, I'll try to uh, ask first the one from, from Allison uh, Reading, a, a Georgetown Law student who asked, um, given that many countries in Africa and elsewhere uh, increased their lending during the, the pandemic and, and interest rates, uh, are now rising um, uh, from traditional multilateral sources and even China. Should public creditors consider debt relief for pandemic loans to avert a debt crisis? And what, and what role is there for the trading system to, in helping to address imbalances? So it looks like you've both kind of previewed parts of that answer, but, the, but, but, but still uh, very relevant questions. Good question, Allison. I, I guess I'll start with the managing director. Uh, what uh, uh, often makes me lose sleep overnight is the debt situation uh, over the world, uh, but especially, especially in low-income countries and especially in low-income countries in Africa. Uh, in 2015, uh, less than 30% of low-income countries were in debt distress or close to it. Today, it is about 60%. And uh, what we lack is a strong discipline of early debt resolution that would make a debt problem of a country not to break the bank of this uh, country. Uh, we have done two important things together with the president of the World Bank. We called for debt service suspension during the pandemic. And this initiative did provide breathing space for countries uh, that have chosen to participate. Uh, it meant that they didn't have to pay their loans, but it expired. We at the IMF have provided debt relief to our poor, poorest members. In other words, we gave grant money so they don't have to pay us during the uh, height of the uh, pandemic. We also, as I said, we issued special drawing rights, which is a way to give reserves to countries that do not add to debt. But where we are particularly concerned is that the initiative put forward called Common Framework for Debt Resolution by the G20 today only has three countries asking for it. Why? Because it is slow to move and because there is no clear incentive for countries to ask. They might lose access to markets if they haven't already lost it. Uh, therefore, we are strongly urging the members of the common framework, uh, both traditional donors and non-traditional do donors like uh, China, uh, India, Saudi Arabia, and the private sector, please, please treat this with a sense of urgency. We need incentive for countries to participate. In other words, if they ask for treatment under, under common framework, they should immediately get that service suspension rights. And we need clear process with beginning and end and steps in between that are followed so countries know what to expect when they step uh, into the framework. Otherwise, it will be more expensive for everybody because debt issues that are not resolved in a timely manner become a real burden on countries for a long time. Uh, we at the IMF continue to think of ways in which we can inject a stronger momentum on the issue of 
that resolution. And Chris, I want to thank the student for caring about it. It is truly a serious problem many countries face. Dr. Ngozi. Yeah, let, let me ask the... Sir? Yes, yes, yeah, go ahead. For, your, 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 yeah. for your response to that question and, and the international trading system, yes. and obviously your yeah. experience as a finance minister is interesting. And the trade imbalances. Well, during the pandemic, one of the things we've worried about uh, trade is, of course, what happens to the private sector in, on the African continent. Uh, it's the private sector that does most of, most of the trading. And unlike rich countries where they had uh, a lot of liquidity support and forbearance from governments and even uh, uh, um, um, forgiveness of loans and so on and so forth, uh, or grants and loans, soft loans, many African countries were not in a position to do this. Some did do. Um, you know, many, many tried to do things along these lines. And I know that... Um, in, in several countries, there was uh, there were tax breaks, there was some forbearance, there was there were longer lead times to pay back loans. So countries did try, um, but a, a part of the problem with trying to redress imbalances is that you must have something to sell, and you must have be able to have uh, financing to sell that. So trade finance has also been a problem, particularly for poorer countries the least developed countries on the continent in the Sahel and so on. So that's what we've been watching and trying to see what governments are doing, what can be done to help support the private sector. How can we work with others? We're not a financial institution, so at the, but we know what is happening with trade. So we can go to um, partner with the IFC, for example, which is one of the things we've been doing, talking to the International Finance Corporation to say, here's a gap in this country, they don't have access to trade finance, particularly during this pandemic. What can you do to help so that those who want to export cotton from Burkina Faso or from Mali and so on can do that? So those are the things we've been uh, looking at, seeing where we can partner to support countries, support the private sector, to help redress those trade imbalances so that indeed the poor countries uh, can tap into the external demands they will see in Asia or Europe or North America. Yeah, you know, this is is fascinating. Unfortunately, we, you know, I am very well aware of the fact that I have two global history makers uh, in your own right. But I want to maybe end with with a last sort of final question, really to to to, to both of you. I mean, you're important in, in lots of different ways, and and you're both history makers in your own right and and as i said at the out, outset uh you both very much appreciate the pull of, of history um for each of you um w when you leave your post what do you hope uh that you'll be remembered for uh, you know a a after your departure what, what would you like your legacy to ultimately be and i'll start with the managing director well, we live in a more shock-prone uh, world, and the shocks uh, that affect the global economy are more diverse. Uh, the pandemic is a clear example, but we also face climate shocks. We have we we face geopolitical uh, shocks, uh, and that makes uh, the fund uh, uh, an institution that has to continue to evolve as it has done in in the past. What I hope is uh, that my legacy, in in, a, in and I'm saying that very uh, with great humility. It is uh, for the great staff of the fund to carry that forward, is that we will uh, have a systemically relevant institution as it has been in the past in building resilience to a more shock prone uh, world and being more inclusive for all its members, for all the people that form our countries. Internally in the fund, I do hope to leave my, my mark in inclusion and diversity. So we at the fund are like the world that forms our membership. Uh, men and women of all races and all ethnicity that is applying uh, to serve the membership that we have space for it. 
uh, we have done a great uh, uh, advancements in uh, uh, today having, uh, for the first time in our history, uh, three women out of the five people that are at the very top of the firm, very diverse women, one of them from Africa. Uh, we, during uh, the last two years, we hired 50% women and very importantly, we hired very diverse people. Uh, and I think that if we are diverse like the world, we would do very well for the world. Dr. Ngozi. Well, um, what, what I would like to be remembered for is for helping to move the WTO as an, an, an organization uh, towards becoming an institution that is fit for purpose for 21st century issues. To do that, I want the organization to be more results oriented, to deliver more. I want to be remembered for that because one of the problems we have is in closing agreements. So I really would like it if before I leave this place, we could one, close on how we respond to this, this pandemic and the future ones. Two, we close on sus a sustainability agreement, the fishery subsidies, which will result in stopping overfishing and overcapacity and reducing it. This is big for 260 million people who are fishermen and women in the world. So even those two, uh, uh, you know, being remembered for results, for contributing to things that make a difference in the life of people. Adding to that, I want to be remembered for bringing the WTO and the staff and members back to the original purpose of the organization, uh, which somehow seems to have been forgotten over the years. The WTO's uh, purpose, as enshrined in its agreement, is to enhance living standards, help create employment, and support sustainable development. And what this says is that the WTO is about people. But when people think about the WTO, they, didn't, they didn't never believe that this organization is about people. They think it's about trade, which is not helpful to poor people, marginalizes people. But that was not what this organization was supposed to do. So I would like to have a legacy of having been able to contribute to reversing the image, to getting results, to bringing energy and uh, interest and light back to the institution. Thank you. So the conclusion well, is when you have, when you have we, women, women in charge, they think about people. And, and uh, I will, it, bravo. Th let me just say, bravo to you. <laughs> this, 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 this conversation is one that I'm never going to forget. You know, um, I, I am, I am <laughs> proud of you both and, and, and uh, yeah, for your, your, your brilliance and your, your humanity, you know, because your institutions are, are ultimately about people. And uh, on behalf of Georgetown and our students, uh, uh, myself, you know, thank you so much for, for this time. I, I know your time is so valuable and, and this, this meant a lot to me and to a lot of people. And, 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 and we, we really do appreciate this, this, this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Nice to bring Chris, Alina and I together again. <laughs> bye bye. Yes, thank bye you. Bye. <laughs>